Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I hope to because today I cannot see you. So yes. Uh, thanks, Ashi. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's one minute. No, it's one thirty. So I think we can start. Uh, welcome uh, everyone to this third session of the series of webinars organized by Eva van Faber TP Breeders Talk Green. I uh, have to say you, we have received more than 600 uh, registrations. Uh, yeah, numbers are going up for now, more than 200 people connecting. So uh, yeah, welcome again. And um, yeah, my name is Ana Granados. I'm the director of FEFA from Faber TP, well, the Secretary General of Faber TP. I would like also to introduce you uh, the rest of the team right now so chala will be also moderating with me uh, the panel discussion but also miriam duru barbara and isabella who are not visible right now but uh, have been working hard to make this section a, su a success so um, i see that people is uh, joining us uh, still now so uh, i'm going to go slowly presenting. Uh, numbers are rising and increasing. So uh, yeah, let's wait one minute perhaps. Could I? Better. I think all of our panelists are connected. Welcome everyone to both Frank, Sigrid and Anna. Uh, we have seen, we have a slide today again to interact with you. We have seen that some of you, you have already answered the question, to the first question. Uh, the first question is to be answered after the third presentation. So yeah, so we don't have to use it right now. Uh, don't worry, we, take, we will take time to, to answer to these three questions that we would like to pose you during the, the session. So yeah, let's go. As I was saying, FF uh, is the voice of more than 40, 100, uh, 40 uh, associations involved in animal breeding and reproduction. Uh, they are working in poultry, uh, ruminants, pigs, aqua and insect breeding. We have also Faber TP, uh, is representing research institutes in Europe working in the same field. And FF members, the, the research part of FF members, are also members of Faber TP. The purpose is to integrate um, and strengthen collaboration with pri between private and public sector academia research uh, in, in the animal breeding sector. So next, uh, please. So just uh, FF uh, and Faber TP. We are involved at the European level in policy and uh, development of. Uh, um, European research programs. We try also to, to, uh, to promote responsible and balanced breeding, responsible research, research and innovation. And uh, yeah, as I said before, we try to connect uh, industry and knowledge institutes to, to collaborate as much as possible. Um, so the next one, please. So the, the structure of this uh, series of webinars, today is the third session. It's around the balance, uh, the, the pillars of uh, balanced breeding that are um, in, in code in, uh, in, um, in the code of good practice for, for responsible breeding. And um, this, uh, these pillars are around, yes, as you can see, animal health and, and welfare, uh, environmental footprint, product quality, and many others. Today, we are going to um, to go through another part of Cold Fabar with genome editing, because Cold Fabar is also promoting and giving pathways to members uh, on the responsible use of breeding and reproduction technologies. So, uh, FF is also involved in projects. We are a research, uh, a knowledge provider. 
and we are active in dissemination. We are starting four more new projects this year. One of them is, uh, has already started. The rest of that it should start later. Um, one more thing about this series of webinars I would like to, to, to tell you before we go to the house rules is that, uh, yeah, FF and Fiber TP, as you could see, we are involved, much involved in research and innovation. So our webinars have a strong scientific component. We are engaged in promoting science-based and objective analysis of situations and decisions. So that's why we try to put uh, research, researchers and science as much as possible uh, in this series of webinars. We hope that it uh, can be understood by everyone. Don't hesitate to ask questions if you don't understand anything and uh, something. Uh, so for your comments, uh, now you are seeing the house rules uh, slide. Use please, you have two boxes. You have the chat and the queue and answer uh, box. Uh, please, for questions, use question and answer box. And if you have any technical problem, you have a comment about the, the, the series of webinars, if you have any proposal or other question, but it's not a question to the panel, please use the chat box. Uh, you can also contact Isabella uh, using her email address. And uh, yeah, not, uh, you, you, have, um, you know that our webinars are recorded. They will be um, uh, downloaded on the, on the website later, uh, and we will provide you a, a summary of the discussions today. So let's go to the program today. Yeah, sorry, I'm forgetting to, to talk about questions um, by Slido. So we are going to use a Slido to try to engage more with you as we cannot see you, but the purpose is to engage a discussion on this topic on genome editing. So we are going to have three questions during what, the duration of the, of the webinar today. Um, yeah, you can scan the, 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 the code with your phones, or you can also put the link in your navigator and uh, take the code V319. Uh, so I think next slide, yes, is to show you the complexity of this topic today and the number of uh, position papers, studies, and uh, um, other uh, references that uh, are talking about genome editing. Um, so, yeah, that is the program. Thanks, Isabella. And um, we are going to start with the first speaker from the European Commission, Franz Swartenbrooks. Sorry, Frank. Can you hear us? And have you? Yes, you are there. That's lovely. <laughs> we are always stressing a dead one. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Good afternoon, Frank. Nice to see you again. Uh, can you share the screen? Um, I have to introduce you a bit. But I have lost. Uh, no, don't worry, Isabella. I'm. A, we can see uh, Frank better. He's going to share his screen. I'm going to introduce him. So Frank is a veterinarian from the Ghent University. Uh, he has also studied two-year postgraduate courses in hygiene and food and animal origin. So he's uh, now, uh, he has been working for the Belgian Food Safety Agency, the FAVV or AFSCA, as you prefer. <laughs> and uh, so in Belgium, and uh, now he's uh, working in the European Commission at Digisante since 2007, I guess and uh, at the Bio Biotechnology Unit. The Biotechnology Unit in Digisante is in charge of uh, drafting the study on the status of gen new genomics techniques that was asked by the European Council in 2019. So Frank, thank you very much again for coming. And uh, yes, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, both you on the screens, perfect. Perfect, okay. So indeed, um, good afternoon to everybody. I, uh, I'm Frank, uh, I work for uh, Indeed DG Sante since uh, a number of years now. And 
active in biotechnology. I'm not the only one in charge. I will not even say that I'm uh, in charge, the final responsible for the study, but uh, we have a, a close team of uh, five, six people working on this study now since, uh, well, the entire last year we worked on this. And uh, okay, I was asked to give you a small presentation about what it is and uh, where we are. But of course, to do this, I need to take you maybe a little bit, a little bit back in time uh, where this comes from, where the study comes from. And I would need to take you back to 2016 when uh, the European Court of Justice got a question from a French uh, court on the interpretation of a uh, provision, uh, definition in a European text being Directive 2118 or Basic Directive for deliberate release into the environment. After that, I will deal with uh, the actual study. So this, this question came to the, the Court of Justice in, in 2016, and in the end, the court ruled, uh, took, uh, took its time to think it over, and in 2018, replied uh, that, uh, to the question. And the question was actually, what the mutagenesis exemption in the directive what is about. Is this applicable to new techniques or not? So maybe you should all know, I guess you know, but for those who don't know, there are a number of things which are organisms which are uh, GMO scientifically, uh, obtained by mutagenesis, uh, but are not globally considered as such. We're talking about pink grapefruit, grapeless uh, fruit, grapeless, uh, uh, sorry, seedless grapes uh, and things like that. They are uh, exempted. They are scientifically seen, they are GMOs, but in the legislation globally, not only in the EU, but also in almost all other countries in the world, these are considered not to be GMOs. They are exempt for the legislation. Uh, the question was, of course, with the emergence of new mutagenesis techniques, uh, whether these uh, products obtained with these new techniques would be part of the exemption, yes or no. Are these, which are scientifically GMOs, are they also in the exemption, yes or no? So after a long deliberation, the court uh, ruled and based this ruling in largely, largely on a recital that is in the, the directive that says that this exemption are based on situations on GMOs where we have a, a number of applications that have been used already and a long history of safety. And this is an interesting uh, uh, thing, of course. Uh, because it means on one hand that uh, what emerged after 2001 for the judge could not have the long history of safe use because it was not there in the past. It also says there is not a number of applications. So therefore the judge ruled that of course these, these uh, organisms obtained with these new techniques would in his view not be part of the exception. That of course means that they are fully subject to all obligations in the GMO legislation. So this gave kind of a shockwave, I would say, through, through uh, I would say, not only the European Union, where we had, uh, I would say, groups cheering for this uh, ruling, and we had other groups crying for this ruling, but it also gave a shockwave, I would say, through, through the global society, which is occupied in this thing, in this field. I would not say that it gave the same shockwave as for example, uh, COVID-19 has done, but uh, in the world of GMOs, this clearly has been uh, much debated uh, by many, many people. We did a lot in the early phases on uh, enforcement with member states, clarification, what needs to be done, what is the immediate consequence of this uh, regarding to field trials that were ongoing, etc. What, how you're supposed to control, how you're supposed to check all of this now, all of a sudden, which, Let's be honest, most of the member states had not expected this outcome. But then after a while, the court came with a question and said, it is probably best that uh, there is a profound study on the topic. And therefore it gave its request in November. Uh, the council sent the request, adopted the request, published it into, uh, into the official journal, but it was addressed to the commission to make a study in the light of this court ruling. What, actually is the status of these novel genomic techniques. This is what the court called and until then, I would say the global wording was novel breeding techniques, new breeding techniques, but since then we refer to them as NGTs, novel genomic techniques, 
we were supposed to, the commission is supposed to explain <clears throat> what the status is. And they define what novel genomic techniques are. These are techniques which are capable to change the genetic material of an organism and that have emerged or have been developed since 2001, which is the cutoff date, the cutoff date of publication of Directive 2001-18, which already uh, mentions this. It is, in fact, not the first uh, directive that mentioned this. If you go back to the predecessor of uh, 2001, which is the Council Directive 2-1990-2020, this also uses the same wording as uh, long history of safe use. Anyhow, the Council asked this to be delivered by April 2021, which is uh, which leaves us not even six weeks anymore, but five weeks. Uh, and we are, uh, I would say we are happy to, to say that we are still still on track. So what is the content of this study? What is really there? Well, it contains a state of play on the implementation and enforcement. And this has been, uh, this is a really highly discussed uh, item because indeed for a number of these, these organisms that are obtained uh, would be difficult to, to, to differentiate from things that can occur naturally. That is really important uh, because of course, you do not want to submit somebody uh, to the GMO legislation unless he's really should be submitted to the GMO legislation. How did we do this? We uh, asked uh, the 27 member states and uh, we listed 150, I think, around 150 stakeholders active in the EU. And these were consulted on all these uh, problems they encountered with implementation and enforcement. In addition, we had some work done by the European Union Reference Laboratory, uh, together with uh, the ENGL, the European Network of GMO Laboratories, which was on the detection of products obtained by these mutagenesis techniques. So what is possible, what is not possible, what are the challenges, what are the possibilities, what are the impossibilities? We asked for three reports. One is ready, it's on the NGT uh, plants, on the plants developed with these uh, techniques. The one on uh, the second one we asked is on uh, microorganisms, GMMs, genetically modified microorganisms, through NGTs, which are mostly used in the fermentation industry and in the industrial uh, biotech. And the last one, uh, which we asked uh, in this order, would be on new genomic techniques, uh, gene edited animals, because um, we think this, this priority reflects the way the situation globally is. There is much more advancement in GE. Uh, plants than there is in uh, GMMs, there could be a lot of also, but G the animals are a bit, I would say globally a bit uh, slower, not so far yet. So it contains also the info on the status and the use of the NGT plants, etc., in the different industries that are the applications that exist, agro-food, industrial, pharmaceutical. Okay. We also include an uh, overview of the risk sentiment of uh, NGT plants. This is work that we have uh, not done ourselves because, of course, we are risk managers, not risk assessors. And we have a very strict separation in the EU between risk management and risk assessors. So this was outsourced to EFSA. EFSA has uh, already done a number, uh, or adopted a number of uh, opinions, which are freely available for everybody on EFSA's website. And we have asked also another part of the commission, the G Joint Research Center, to give us an overview of uh, what is actually the developments in the techniques and the products, products which are marketed already or expected to be marketed soon, not in 20 years, but soon. So that gives us an idea about where we are going in the, in the next years. So that is actually all because uh, I cannot take, uh, I cannot share with you the content of the study. I mean, this is still under uh, under embargo, of course, it's at the final stages and uh, we have to also to respect, uh, to respect the protocol. This is a, a study that has been asked by the council uh, to the commission and the commission will, of course, first uh, share the study with the council, who is the requester, which is, of course, the council represents the 27 governments of the 27 uh, member states. And immediately after that, we will do the necessary uh, campaigns and information to uh, update the competent authorities specifically in the member states, etc., and the general public and everybody. That is quite clear. So what's the take home um, message? Well, we should not, not forget that uh, the organisms obtained by these new techniques are now subject at this moment for the obligation of the current GMO legislation. That's clear with all the advantages and disadvantages for competent authorities. 
what is the state of the council crest we are almost there i would say within the unit uh, we can see the finish line and we are happy that uh, the work is, is uh, finished because it has been a, a lot of work but what i would mostly say to everybody is you have to take your responsibilities and participate in the debate that will follow because i guess the debate that will follow after the publication of the study is probably i think the most important debate we will have in the history of GMOs in the European Union. I think it will be even more important than the initial debates about what kind of legislation do we want. And therefore, I think it's very important that everybody has his voice heard. I would say, don't take anything for granted. Don't think I don't have to speak out as an organization because everybody knows uh, what I think and it's common sense to go in the direction as I want it participate and have yourself heard, your organization especially. And that would be it. For me, there's a small picture there. Indeed, it is a long, straightforward way. When it's really straightforward, or when it makes a little bend at the end over there, that is something else. But uh, that would be my final wording on, on this. And I hope you will all clearly follow what, what we are going to liberate as studies in the... Uh, Coming five weeks, well, not in the coming five weeks, in five weeks. Uh, thank you, Anna, and I call it to you. Perfect. Uh, I hope everyone understood <laughs> all the legal wording. Uh, I think it's not new for most of, of, uh, of the attendees, so that could be great. Um, that will be good. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, we, that's the purpose of today. I um, mean, we uh, would like to engage dialogue and debate on this topic. So that's uh, uh, one step uh, we used to do uh, here in Brussels. So, um, yeah, let's go to the next speaker. Thanks again, Frank. So I would like to introduce you, Anna Warhelius from uh, the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. Uh, so Anna uh, is the group leader um, uh, is, is, oh, sorry, is uh, the principal scientist uh, 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 on, on uh, salmon uh, research and uh, in genetics, and uh, she's uh, working in genomedics. Uh, that's why she's here. So, um, yep, uh, Anna, I hope uh, you can, yes, I, I can see you. Yeah, yeah, I will share my screen now. That would be great. Yeah. And you have 10 minutes too. We are on time. So uh, that will be. So first of all, I want to thank for being invited to present some of our work done with gene editing. And it sort of fits very well with uh, what Frank said. I'm only going to present what we call the lowest level of targeted mutagenesis, uh, which is the fish that I'm showing actually here, the yellow fish here. We have only knocked out for one single gene using this gene editing technology. And I mean, the effect is big, but it's only one out of 45,000 genes that has been removed. Uh, so uh, uh, this is just how we developed the technology using this as a single tracer for mutation. Now we're using this technology to target genes which are in interesting uh, for, for production and also for the sustainability uh, of salmon farming. And in this context, we have then developed an idea that we are working on, which we call the virgin salmon, uh, which is a salmon which is uh, uh, salmon that is uh, genetically uh, sterile but still fertile, uh, hence can produce a lot of uh, sterile uh, fish if we get the whole method um, to work. Uh, so I just go back and, and show why we're doing this. Uh, we want to have the sterile salmon because uh, most salmon are then reared in open sea cages and there is uh, escapees every year. It's decreasing because you have better technology to maintain or keep the fish, but still it's a problem. And also as the breeding gets more and more advanced, uh, the genetic differences between the wild and the farmed salmon will increase and this salmon in Norway are, are bred at the same place as the wild salmon. So there has been uh, uh, shown in several publications that the, when they intercross the, the farmed salmon with the, 
while some of this changes the genetic integrity and also the life history of salmon. So in this context, my group has been working with sterile salmon for a long time. We've first been developing and still working on triplets. Uh, although the triplets has some welfare problems, we also then been working with other types of technologies. And in this context, we started to work with uh, trying to develop vaccines for sterility. And when we started that project, we also needed to see whether which genes could be a good target to, 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 um, um, to develop sterility. So then we started with functional genetics in, in Salmon. And this was just at the time as this CRISPR-Cas9 technology was published. Um, so it sort of was only already in 2014, 2050, we developed this technique in Salmon. And as shown here, we could knock out here the dead end gene in salmon and we could make fish which lacks germ cells as illustrated here where you see a, a knocked out fish for dead end which then lacks the ovarian uh, cells the oocytes while well, the control has it and then this fish is not only sterile we also see that it's sort of very beneficial because it doesn't uh, enter precocious maturity which is another problem in salmon pouring the, when they enter precocious maturity especially then the males uh, then the, the fish uh, have not so good welfare and also stop uh, growing and also more susceptible to disease. Uh, so they are sort of not only this uh, genetics protecting the wild strains, it's also a good welfare. However, um, before I go in more closer to this fish, I just wanted to show you uh, how it's done when we, when we edit the fish in salmon. So we made a movie just to illustrate how this is done. Um, so this is our broodstock that we produced for the albino knockout gene. Uh, uh, so actually, it was uh, four or five years ago now. Um, and we are working with many different features. So it starts with that you, you, you get the sperm from the males, you check the quality, and we fertilize the eggs. And then, then, then my uh, Lena in my group, she's how prepared the CRISPR constructs together with the, 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 the Cas9, which is then targeting the specifically what gene you want to target. And then you have an enzyme that comes with it that cuts the gene at that place. And then we inject single eggs like this after three to six hours after fertilization. So uh, during a day you can inject something like one person can inject about a thousand eggs. And then you put them into the hatchery and they stay there for three months to hatch. And then after four years, they're about 15 kilos if we're lucky. So all of this takes some time. Um, however, no. the problem with the dead engine is that we remove the germ cells. So we cannot breed this trait. Um, so then we came up with the idea that maybe we could rescue uh, this knockout. Um, and then be able to produce large amount of, of sterile fish. So we're currently working with this method uh, where we sort of knock out the dead end gene uh, in the wild fish, or in the wild type fish, not in the wild, but in the wild type fish. And then we also at the same time add mRNA, which codes for this protein. So then even though the, these fish will not lack the dead end gene in the genome, they will still be able to form uh, primordial germ cells, which then become germ cells because we added this mRNA. And we have shown this and uh, show the publication later, we could get this fish then to produce uh, germ cells. And this year we also then crossed out this fish and we have then produced this sterile offspring. And we also then now, we sort of added dead and MRA again to add, make this virgin broodstock. So essentially we have, you will only treat the broodstock to become um, fertile genetically sterile, but you will not touch the, the sterile offspring. So this is just showing how it looks like. This is then a virgin knockout, which you also added albino knockout to because to see them. Uh, and here you can see that these ones have oocytes in their ovary, while the control fish, which is just knocked out for dead and haven't been rescued, don't have any oocytes in their ovary. Uh, and also we could deep sequence the ovaries to see that they didn't contain any, any wild type dead end. So all of these fish, the rescued males and the females, they completely like the dead end gene in their gonads, in their germ cells. Uh, so just uh, two years ago, or last, not this autumn, not to autumn 2019, we could simulate the males.
to produce sperm by just adding temperature to speed up the project. So this is Hilal. She's been the postdoc in the project. She's there now. So these are quite small. That's what we stimulated the men in the tour early. And then we were able to get sperm from this and we also fertilized this sperm to white type eggs. Uh, just to see that we could get the mutation over in the next generation. Which we did. And uh, this year we continued, because this year now finally we got the females to mature. So this is our Nima group is um, taking out eggs of one of these fish, which are then genetically sterile, but still has produced egg cells. So we did that for both males and females, and we crossed out nine crosses now in November and December this year. We have seen that we got dead end knockouts in the offspring. Uh, but we haven't been able to, oh, they're still too small to open to see that it's working. And also we made a second generation that we now have rescued so that we could sort of make a stable line of virgin rootstock. So if it's, now this is the crucial steps that we're working on um, to, to sort of get this final parts of the idea together. Um, so we are going to this summer then to see if the fish are are completely sterile and also that we have a very good dead end mutation transmission from females and males. And we're also then going to try to establish a stable virgin line with only one homozygous mutation. And then we also are real eager then to, to look for this off targets to see that the gRNA in this hasn't cut the DNA anywhere else in the genome except for in this gene. So this is uh, the plan for the next year. So that's actually all I want to say. I want to say thank you to my group and also to the funders and to the industrial partners that we work with, Aquay and, and Mobi. And also, if you want to read further, you can read in this publication that came out this autumn describing the first steps of this technology. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, many thanks. We had a small problem to listen to you when we are uh, with the music of the of the uh -huh. video but i hope that uh, it's uh, i i don't know i mean from, I'm sorry. Uh, I, there was a, a message in the chat i'm not sure that everyone could uh hear properly perhaps you can just again repeat what you were yeah this was just the sperm production showing the sperm production from these virgin males um so we were stimulated them to be, become early maturers, which you can do with males, but not in females. Uh, this was just to be able to do the technology first, faster. So this is the small males that we were then spawning one year ahead, just to see that we got a good genotype transmission to the next generation. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Again, you can ask your questions uh, in the Q and answer um, section. Uh, we will take the questions for the panel discussion. Um, and uh, we continue with the program now. So we are welcoming now Sigrid Bradley from uh, the NCE Header Bio Cluster in Norway again. Hi, Sigrid, I can see you. <laughs> I Hello. hope you can. Yes, and we can hear you too. That's great you are here with us today. Uh, we are very happy you can take part on this uh, uh, webinar. We have uh, some of the attendees have already probably heard about you and the proposal coming from Norway two years ago, three years ago, I don't remember now. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to give you the floor to be sure that we are um, following the program uh, and to keep uh, the time under control. Uh, okay. okay, so I'll try to share my screen share the just screen. a second. Let's see. Because you are going to tell what is the innovative, the innovate uh, program. So I'm not, I think it's a. Uh... So can you see my slide now? Perfect. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Great. So thank you very much, Anna, and to the rest of the organizers for inviting me. Uh, you gave me a short introduction, but I will just say a couple of words about uh, my role in the Gene Innovate Research Consortium. Uh, so this is a collaboration between breeding companies and academia and the public sector to explore 
how genome editing can be used in crops and livestock. Uh, and the consortium also includes three FAB members, uh, Gino, Topix Norsvin, and Aquagan. Uh, and here the aim is to uh, develop genome editing as a research tool to study plant and animal genetics, but also to um, uh, explore whether it has the potential to be a breeding tool, and then in particular to improve plant and animal health. So, uh, um, but today I will, however, uh, be talking about legal and societal aspects of genome editing and a proposal for a smart and modern regulation. So, why do we need innovation in governance? Uh, well, uh, firstly, because of the rapidly evolving uh, technological landscape. So we now have a toolbox that gives us a wide range of possibilities in uh, terms of making genetic changes. So with uh, different genetic engineering technologies, we can do everything from making temporary changes. And Anna just showed you, for instance, using mRNA to uh, temporarily change gene expression. Uh, we can also mimic genetic changes that arise in nature or that can be uh, achieved through conventional breeding methods all the way up to uh, synthetic genetic sequences and potentially also fully synthetic organisms. So the range is very wide. Uh, and secondly, genetic engineering can be used to address many different challenges. And uh, uh, of course, these are pressing challenges such as improving food security uh, and uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate change and also animal welfare. And thirdly, as uh, we have shown in a survey that we have done in Gene Innovate, uh, the public opinions on genome editing uh, can vary and they depend on the purpose for which the technology is used. Uh, so, for example, as, as you can see here, the majority are positive towards traits that can be uh, perceived to uh, have some sort of benefit. So both in crops and, and uh, livestock, and then in particular in terms of plant and animal health. Uh, and also, as you can see here, the, this also includes such as the, um, the sterile salmon that Anna talked about just now, where also majority are positive. Uh, they are, however, less positive, uh, and the majority are in fact uh, skeptical towards using genome editing to uh, increase productivity in animals and also for what can be perceived as more trivial traits, such as, for example, changing uh, color. So uh, it's not uh, just uh, for or against the technology, it's what it is used for. Uh, and despite all of these nuances, uh, the debate that we see in Europe is still very black and white, and it is very polarized. So, uh, and this is also then reflected in the regulatory system, which you heard about earlier. So a product is either a GMO, which uh, currently covers everything that is produced with genetic engineering and with the uh, regulatory burden that that implies, or it isn't. So uh, this has consequences. So the current regulation uh, basically means that uh, uh, it is a time consuming and expensive approval process that favors big industry and uh, is unaffordable for, for smaller uh, companies. Uh, producers will often choose inferior methods to achieve similar results. And Anna mentioned uh, in her presentation, uh, making sterile salmon, uh, triploid sterile salmon, which are not GMO. And this is then, uh, uh, in terms of the regulatory status, will be preferred. Uh, of course, different regulations and labeling requirements for what is essentially identical products will lower industry interest to use uh, technologies that can be beneficial. Uh, and um, of course, even enforcing legislation, uh, which it is uh, currently will be challenging, especially in terms of um, detection requirements when products are uh, in principle indistinguishable. But also deregulation has consequences. So if you deregulate a technology, uh, you basically have no oversight. Uh, you have no option to assess risk or other consequences, such as the impact on sustainability. And you have no real consumer choice if uh, you cannot uh, label a product. So uh, this is the background for a project that I was involved in when I was working for the Norwegian Biotechnology Advisory Board where we uh, asked ourselves the question, so how can we utilize the potential of genetic engineering 
in a safe and sustainable way that promotes trust and transparency? So this is the more important question. And we came up uh, with um, a more differentiated regulatory framework that better reflects the different uses of genetic engineering. Uh, so in short, it is a three-tiered uh, framework based on the nature of the genetic change that has been made. So uh, here, the well, uh, first of all, organisms that have non-heritable changes would be exempted. So they would not be considered uh, GMO at all. Uh, but within the framework on tier one, uh, which would be subject only to notification, we would place organisms that have uh, genetic changes that are comparable to products that can be obtained through conventional breeding methods. In other words, products that do have a history of safe use. On tier two, uh, which would be subject to an expedited as a, uh, assessment, we would place organisms uh, that have uh, other or larger species specific genetic changes, which uh, are unlikely to pose a significant risk. And on tier three, we would uh, keep the, the transgenic organisms that are uh, the familiar GMOs and also organisms that have artificial genetic sequences added to them. Uh, so, and all of these uh, products would then, uh, we would also uh, argue that there should be an assessment of uh, benefits uh, and sustainability for these products so that we could use regulation as a steering tool for the technology. And importantly, uh, you could tailor uh, labeling and traceability and detection requirements to the different tiers to make it feasible, because we know that one of the major headaches now is that uh, products that are genome edited that are indistinguishable from other products really cannot be detected. Uh, and in the process of developing this model, we actually placed public dialogue at the heart of the project and used it as a steering tool to shape policy. So we asked Norwegian organizations and the public uh, on their views about regulation of genetic engineering. And we got many responses. We got uh, over 50 Norwegian organizations that expressed their views. And on the one side, especially from the industry side, uh, their main uh, concerns was that they need an enabling framework that lowers the regulatory hurdle uh, so that they can use this technology. And the framework should be science-based and risk proportionate, and it should offer more predictability. Uh, on the other side, uh, which are stakeholders that typically are opposed to genetic engineering uh, traditionally, they expressed their concerns that these are technologies that we have little experience with. Uh, they could have a large impact on ecosystems, especially when uh, the technological development and deployment is rapid and that uh, requires a need for precaution. But there were also many shared views between and across all stakeholder groups. And what they did agree on was that there is a value in regulatory oversight and public trust, that gene editing and other genetic engineering technologies can contribute to sustainable agriculture and aquaculture, that competitiveness on the international market is crucial, and that it is important to safeguard health, environment, and to consider societal benefit, sustainability, and ethics. And we believe that our proposed tiered system really merges uh, these different important aspects. It is science-based, uh, it lowers the regulatory hurdle for using genetic engineering, but it still provides oversight and control. And this in turn then will inspire transparency and public. And while it is probably difficult to get political backing for a radical overhaul of the regulation in the current political climate. This model offers a compromise that hopefully there could be political willingness for. And uh, now this is of course high on the political agenda. In Norway, we are doing a review of the legislation. Uh, and of course, as you heard in the first presentation, uh, there's also a study being conducted in the EU. And we hope that uh, we really can be forward-looking and find a regulatory system that can take us into the future. Uh, getting it wrong by over-regulating these new technologies means uh, huge opportunity costs. It could also result in a lack of transparency because uh, genome-edited products can go undetected and it might be tempting uh, to, to not declare genome-edited uh, products. 
But under regulation, on the other hand, can result in a lack of control and a lack of trust. So we do need uh, consumers on board for genetic engineering to have a real future. So getting it right, on the other hand, will allow us to harness the potential of genome editing and other in uh, technologies to enable a transition to a green economy and a sustainable future in a safe way while maintaining public trust. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sigrid. Uh, many, many thanks. Uh, yeah, I think you are right. This is a quite polarized debate. So that's why we are so happy to uh, host today this meeting. We hope there will be other ones. Uh, so we are going to move now for the first question, Slido. Uh, there are some people asking uh, for the for the link. Now it's in your screen. You can check your phones or you can type also the link uh, in your navigator. And uh, yeah, please participate. Give us your opinion on this question one, which is the, the following areas of application of genome editing. Do you think will be the most interesting? And uh, we are going to see in uh, two minutes uh, the, the responses uh, uh, in another, uh, yes, in our navigator, uh, stopping sharing. You can still see you, if you agree, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's ongoing. Yeah, so vote. You can still vote with the same uh, code that this is, yeah, is uh, now. So you can go to slido.com with the code V319 or scanning the code in the screen. And uh, yeah. yeah. Still moving, not a lot. I mean, that's, uh, uh, we cannot see the last one. Uh, yes, yeah, that's not relevant. I mean, it is quite interesting to see that most, the most important application considered by our members is the main one here, again, responding to this question. That's perfect. I should say. So 60% is talking about disease resistance, a bit more than 15 on animal welfare. It's not changing a lot. Uh, numbers are still increasing. 144 people voting, have vote. And uh, yeah, I mean, should, stay quite stable or we can just wait one minute more is a better perhaps on that yeah we will talk a bit about all these applications later during panel discussion with Craig Lewis and Laurent Schibler from uh, uh, FFM Power TP uh, it's just to know what do you think about just now. Okay. Yeah, 170 votes. But we are more than 300, guys. So you are not voting. <laughs> we have half people voting. <laughs> okay. Uh, I suppose that's... Uh, you can vote from more than one. No, here is the most one. Yeah, no, it's only one answer. Okay, I think we can stop. It's all the time around 60% of people think that it's interesting for disease resistance. Uh, so yeah, we are going to go ahead the program and introduce Frank Neibon from Utrecht University. I think we can see his photo and uh, background uh, on the screen from now. Hi, Frank. Hi. Uh, yes, I can see you. So I hope everyone can see you too. And uh, yeah. 
Okay. So Frank is a professor at the um, Utrecht University. Uh, we know him very well in FF and Faber TP because he's participating in just editing project in, in the Netherlands about uh, social uh, uh, public acceptance and general medicine in, in the Netherlands. Um, he's also a member uh, of the research council. Uh, so I, I'm going to, to give you the floor. Can you try to share the screen? Yep, I will. Okay. So I, I think you can start because you are going to run over okay. time and we cannot see any more the present the slide with your presentation. So okay. Can you see the slide perfect. now? Yeah, perfect. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for the introduction and also for um, the kind invitation. Um, as said, um, I work at, at Utrecht University, uh, both at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the, and at the Faculty of Humanities, um, and also I'm affiliated to the um, Wageningen University, and that's a bit of um, how I try to bridge um, uh, different fields and not only see ethics as a kind of standalone um, discipline, although it, it has its own benefits and its own um, legitimate position, but al always try to um, bridge um, more um, veterinary or more um, animal science topics with um, issues of um, ethical reflection. What I want to do with you is to, uh, well, um, to look at first the step from, from the, the, the more technical issues to why we need um, attention to uh, ethics, societal issues, and I think already the presentation by Sigrid um, showed um, part of or, or a lot of, of the, the relevance of it, so I can, can keep that uh, relatively short. Um, and in my title I said there is a need to broaden the debate on breeding and I thought how, how to structure that in 10 minutes, so as you can see I have four steps um, where I think we can breed brought the breeding discussion um, and I will show examples of two projects. Um, one is the Bovrek project which is uh, strictly not on gene editing but um, is informative at least for these points and the other one is the project that Anna already mentioned, the uh, research uh, council uh, from the Netherlands funded project on, on gene editing. Um, so the first is of course um, you, you cannot do anything in, in breeding um, without having um, sufficient um, information and, and knowledge about what it is. But you, you also need um, normative issues. Um, but the question is, of course, where do these come from? And, and I think already, if you look at the different aspects, um, each of them um, are not only asking for very technical um, questions, um, but they also um, are uh, about breeding is, is goal-directed. So the question is, what, what do we aim for? What is valuable? What is preferred? Um, that's not only a question um, that we can answer from biology, um, but that needs reflection on, um, on values, um, on um, a certain future perspective on, of what we think uh, to be desirable, um, similar to, um, to technology. Um, how should it be used? Um, who is allowed for, to use it? Um, so you have questions about power, about responsibility, um, also about um, uncertainty, especially um, you already noticed in, in, in the first presentation um, where um, it, it was about um, approved safety, history of safety. Um, whereas of course we, we currently, in spite of all kind of research, um, cannot speak about that. Um, so, so it's the question of um, how to deal with that. Um, that's not only a technical issue, but also about um, what risk do we want to, to accept. Um, and of course, especially in this field, it's very important to take on board that we deal with animals. Um, animals are um, more than just instruments, they, they are valued. Um, at the same time, um, already in Europe, we do not have a simple consensus of how to value um, these animals, let alone um, what that implies if we start um, breeding and um, genome editing in the context of animals. So um, 
it's not only about the how and what, um, in spite of, of its importance um, and its relevance in the context of genome editing, um, but also um, on questions of the why and, and for whom. And, and therefore, um, you enter the discussion um, on, on ethics. But then the question is, where does ethics fit in? Sorry, it's a little bit annoying. There's an automatic click in it. Um, so, so quite often you see that it is seen as something um, as an add-on. So, so we, we do our um, research, we do our innovations, um, and of course, um, somewhere um, along that line, um, we have to include um, ethics and then mainly as an idea of how to increase public acceptance. Um, and although I do not deny um, that uh, public acceptance is a relevant part um, of uh, this, this type of discussion, um, it's not something linear um, where you can say at the end um, we have to look at acceptance or at the end we have to look at, at the ethical issues. Um, it has to be included right from the start um, and therefore the attention to ethics has to be integrated. Yeah. So um, already um, in the discussion on, um, on, on technical innovations, um, when it is implemented, when um, just like the previous presentation, we think uh, about uh, a policy and regulation. So it's not a standalone, uh, but it has to bridge and be included in all parts um, of um, the, uh, the, the steps towards um, a, a potential implementation um, and practical use of gene editing in practice. So then the question is, of course, um, where do we need to um, broaden uh, the debate? And, and the first step is to include more than experts. Um, of course, the, the experts both in, in, in ethics and, and social science, in, in livestock breeding are essential. And also to deal with the um, ethical issues um, because you, you need um, good, sufficient information um, to have that discussion. But experts are simply not enough. Um, the public engagement is, is essential um, and, and only engaging with the technical experts simply limits the debate um, and limits um, the perspectives um, that you need to um, include uh, in this discussion. And to just give two examples of, of the project uh, we run um, is, one is um, uh, in, in the Bofric project, um, the so-called Demox game, um, which is by Donald Bruce uh, adjusted to discussions on um, uh, genomic selection, um, where we try with, with a, a card game to enhance discussion. Um, which give you information, which trigger um, a debate, um, and which is not aimed to say, well, we, we want to build acceptance only, um, but to um, engage persons, people in, 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 in the public um, in this type of discussion to make them understand what's going on, but also make up their own mind um, of, this, uh, of this innovation. At the same time, in the um, Just Editing project, um, we interviewed a lot of experts, but we also deliberately included uh, focus group discussions with um, a general public. And we did it together with uh, Sarah Minnefeld and uh, Phil McNaughton. Um, and the interesting thing is that from these focus group discussions, we get a lot of um, relevant information, I'll come back to that later, um, which at least um, is, is uh, not only in contrast with um, the interviews with the expert, but at least broaden um, the focus and the discussion. So then the second point is to say, well, we, we need to do more than risks. Um, you see that um, there still is the, the dominant um, institutional debate is, is on, on measurable risks. Um, whereas the public debates are, are much more than that. Um, and to explain that is that, um, for instance, in, in the Demox game, um, you can say, well, the discussion on how to use, um, in this case, genomic selection is not only about how safe it is, uh, but for instance, also that you can use it um, to support local breeds. 
And then the discussion is about um, tradition, about um, independence, about regional aspects, um, which is much broader um, than the discussion whether it's safe or not. Um, similarly, um, if also from the um, focus group discussions, but also from, from the DISC study, um, within the, the ethical framework of the Just Editing project, um, we noticed that a lot of um, discussions depend on um, the basic value you attach to plants, um, animals and humans. Um, whether you see gene editing as something of um, a view of moral perfection, um, or whether, for instance, uh, discussions on, uh, on, on, on breeding practices as such, you think to be uh, problematic. So then the third is that it's important to, um, to do more than just welfare. So the animal welfare um, is, of course, highly important and, and is a real additional issue uh, next to plant breeding. So they are in, seen as sentient beings um, that have interest. But the important point is that it cannot be reduced um, to welfare only. Um, and to show you um, that in spite of its importance um, to take welfare on board, um, the aspects related to animals um, are not the same. You see that from a review um, in gene editing by uh, De Graaf and others, um, it's seen already showed that, that um, yes, it is about welfare, but also animals can be harmed in other ways. Um, the recent um, opinion by the EGE also mentioned that um, you can talk about de-animalization of animals, so that you remove certain capacities from animals, um, such as cognitive, cognitive capacities. And yes, of course, in some cases, um, these are relevant in terms of welfare, but in a lot of situations, you could say, well, it has to do with a lack of respect for the individual animal rather than um, a welfare only. Um, and a, a final example is a paper uh, I co-authored with uh, Kuhn Kramer, um, where we showed that a, the concept of, of telos, so that, that an animal has an aim in itself, itself um, uh, that, that can be frustrated, um, has a, a relevant uh, tool, um, a relevant part to play in the discussion on what we do with animals in terms of breeding. So, Yes, um, animal welfare is highly important, but at the same time, we cannot um, reduce the discussion to welfare only. Finally, um, it's sorry, um, it's important to look at um, more than only the new issues. Um, so quite often, the ethical discussion is focusing on what's new. Um, so what's different in gene editing from um, other um, innovations in breeding or, or classical uh, characteristics of breeding. But then already the question is, what do we mean with new? And there, I think one anecdotal point, but, but it's relevant. So from the um, review for the interviews we did with researchers on gene editing, um, part of the researchers indicated, so well, actually um, it's not really new what we're doing. So there is continuity. Um, and, and more or less the, the uh, conclusion was it doesn't raise real moral concerns. So yes, of course, we have to be careful. What, mm. um, in the focus group discussions, um, uh, some respondents also said, well, actually, this is not new. But they say, well, it's not new because we have the idea that companies um, are manipulating animals and plants um, already for so long. So um, they're doing this already. Um, and and uh, it, it only shows the um, moral unacceptability of the whole system. So both of them say, well, it's not new, um, but they completely disagree um, on whether or not um, that newness or the lack of newness um, uh, is, is uh, the start for, for the discussion. So already um, it's important um, to be aware of if people say, well, it's not new and um, what we actually mean. In addition, um, the question is, where is the relevance of the newness? So for instance, in the genomic selection project, um, it seems that there are not really new ethical concerns. 
So you could say, okay, well, that's, that's clear. So then it's morally neutral. Um, and, and from some part in the genet uh, genome editing project, it's sometimes more or less the same. However, um, it's important to be aware that even if it doesn't raise new questions as such, the fact that the pace of the development or um, the uncertainty um, issues about responsibility could imply that well-known discussions come back, um, raise um, new points of concern um, that needs discussion um, among experts, um, but also within the public. And more, more, most importantly, I would say, um, new technologies quite often can make existing debate um, much more explicit. Um, and maybe, yes, um, that's not the problem of gene editing as such, but it may be um, that due to a new technology, you suddenly end up with a discussion on why do we breed animals at all? Um, what is actually the whole idea of sustainable livestock farming? And you can say, well, that's not specific to gene editing. Um, but at the same time, we have to be aware that new technologies may pick up these broader issues. So I think this um, is a, a line um, to, to take on board and therefore um, not try to limit the discussion. Um, and, and yes, maybe um, you end up with um, pictures like this with a lot of concepts and questions um, uh, these both are from, from, from the, the, the two projects I, I refer to. Um, so I'm, I'm completely um, aware that this will not make the discussion easier. Um, and it will not lead automatically to um, easy answers. Um, but at the same time, it can do justice to the complexity at stake um, and also the views of all involved in livestock breeding. And I think this enables you professionals to act in a responsible way in the most little sense that you have um, the ability to answer not only what you're doing, um, but also why. Um, and I think that is um, uh, only to be reached if you broaden up um, the debate rather than to um, try to reduce it and say, well, then, then we can answer it as, as easy as possible. Um, sorry for the change, strange um, uh, automatic um, moves from one to another slide, um, but I want to um, thank uh, your attention, but also my colleagues who are involved in, in this project and leaving it to this point. Thank you much, Frank. Oh, uh, yeah, don't worry about the slides. It's uh, something <laughs> that was not important. Uh, so uh, I have a new question. Some of you already started to answer. Apologize, Penny. We have forgotten to uh, add, add a new, uh, uh, another, yeah, a last answer to the questions on Slido. That's, uh, yeah, that's a known of a bow. Uh, of the solutions or the applications uh, that could be uh, raised by uh, genome editing. So the, the new question uh, is, uh, which areas of application of genome editing do you think could be perceived positively by consumers and other stakeholders? We have already 40 answers. Um, and yes, it's on, ongoing. So it's the, the question before the panel discussion. We are going to move after to the panel discussion. Okay, you still this is resistance. The first one, but not the only one because here you can answer for more than one. You can vote for more than one answer. So, um, yeah. Still one minute. And uh, yes, it's uh, quite the same between animal welfare and disease resistance, but the voting still 
arriving, so we are going just to wait 30 seconds, 20 seconds. <laughs> 150 answers. Yeah, 60, 65% for both animal health and welfare, but protection of wild populations and protection of genetic diversity are running behind too. I mean, to squat the... We have got this answer because that was, well, today the audience is quite um, large, but this is the questions we address. Uh, two years ago to our members to, to try to know what they think about, they think about uh, genome editing applications, and it is quite the same. Uh, yes. So yes, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. I think it's not uh, increasing a lot from now. So yeah, so first and second one, very close one to each other. This is resistance to animal welfare. Um, and after we have the protection of wild populations and uh, genetic diversity. I will be a little bit more explained now. So I would like to introduce you the chairman of EFA and Faber TP, Craig and Laurent. Are you somewhere there? Yes. Open your, yes, cameras and uh, micros. I can I'm see there. Laurent, I don't know. Okay, Craig is there somewhere. We cannot see, I cannot see you, but suppose yeah. the rest. Uh, Okay, good. So, uh, Laurent, I think you are the first one. Let me know if I'm wrong. Maybe, sure. Yeah. I, couldn't, I yeah. couldn't hear you at the end of the call yesterday to decide who was the first one to <laughs> starting, mm -hmm. explaining EFA and Farber TP uh, views on this topic of genome editing. So, go ahead. The first one will be okay, great. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to all the panelists who provide us a very interesting presentation and very inspiring presentation, I think. Um, yeah, maybe I can just explain uh, what, uh, how the conclusion of many discussion about genome editing uh, within FiberTP. Uh, FiberTP, as explained by Anna, brings together breeding uh, organization as well as scientific institutes. And we uh, discussed a lot with several uh, different visions in order to try to define a common vision of pros and cons of this technology for both the animal science and the breeding se sector. And we came to the conclusion that this technology provides great opportunities to improve knowledge and to meet uh, a diversity of social society needs. But at the same time, we recognize that genome editing is not a magic bullet and is not absolutely required to improve sustainability of the livestock sector. Genome editing is just one additional tool uh, which could be more efficient in some circumstances. Um, in research, for example, uh, today, sequencing makes it possible to determine the, the whole DNA sequence in a few days. Identification of mutation is quite easy, including uh, deleterious mutation occurring naturally during gametogenesis and leading to genetic defects. But the role of most genes and the role of most and the, the effect of most mutation are still far from being fully understood. Genome editing may first help defining this role in livestock species instead of rodent experimental models. And this would be much more relevant due to the physiological differences across species. Like, likewise, for the, the breeding sector, genome editing could be used to speed up the transfer of some existing mutation from one breed to another, a process we call introgression. Uh, in cattle, for instance, this process of multiple steps of crossing and back crossing takes about 10 years. In contrast, it could be completed in only three years using genome editing, possibly with reduced impact on uh, genetic diversity compared to introgression. Um, generally speaking, genome editing application in farm animals uh, serves the same goals as selection, but may increase genetic gains. Um, but as already stated, it's not a magic bullet. Most traits of interest are governed by a huge number of genes. Um, currently, about 400 to 500 genes 
under selection to improve milk production or, or reproduction, uh, for instance. And for most of these genes, the causative mutation have yet to be identified. Moreover, breeding goals include a large number of traits. Uh, for instance, uh, up to 60 different traits related to production, reproduction, product quality, animal health, and so on, uh, are under selection uh, in, in France for dairy breeds. As a consequence, even if genome editing could be technically applied to such a large number of mutations, genomic selection would be more suitable to deal with such complex traits. So the, the main added value of genome editing is definitely for a single traits, uh, simple traits governed by a single gene or for creating new disease resistance. Um, alleles, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to create new disease resistance alleles and, and prevent animals to be infected or contaminated by uh, viruses or bacteria, or sometimes for very specific applications such as those uh, presented by Anna in our, in our talk. Thus, at FibroTP, we consider that the technology should not be prohibited by any regulation. However, we agree that it should probably be regulated in order to ensure that uh, users adopt strict ethical and food safety uh, regulation. And um, in this respect, the GMO regulation is probably not fully relevant since the issue doesn't rely on the te technology by itself, but more on the application. Uh, indeed, as, as explained before by Frank, many questions raised by genome editing revive older general questions about the use of animals both for production or experiments or um, relate, are related to the intensification of production, relevance of breeding objectives and many other ethical aspects, such as to know whether it's active, acceptable or not to modify an animal to suit its breeding environment. That's why um, uh, we also think at the Fraber TP that responsible research and innovation may help us to defining rules of acceptance, taking all stakeholders' point of view into account. Um, in, in this respect, I would just like to mention the upcoming H2020 Remigen project. In one work package of this project, scientists will develop and make use of um, advanced model of societal dialogue to define the room of acceptance of breeding goal, genomic selection, reproductive biotechnology, and genome editing, and the interactions of all this uh, technology, which could be um, combined in, in several ways. This process will engage farmers, industry, NGO, diversity of experts, policymakers, and citizens from at least, I think, eight countries, and should provide guidelines. So um, don't hesitate to contact Anna if you are interested in participating in such an action, I think. And last but not least, I think uh, Fiber TP also asks for a legal import framework in order to ensure transparency with introduction of uh, genome edited animals and, and products in Europe. Otherwise, uh, European animal producer and breeders will be unfairly competing against uh, imported genome editing uh, products. I think that's try to summarize the discussion within Fiber TP. And maybe Craig will provide more inputs from the industry yeah. partners. Okay, Laurent, thanks. Uh, Craig, something to add? What's this complete explanation <laughs> given by Laurent? Uh, yeah, th thanks, Laurent, and uh, that's a that's a tough act to follow. But uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, everybody for attending. I hope you're safe and well. Um, I think what I will add to what Laurent said is really is as FAB, you know, and Anna and, and discussed what the team at FAB does. But it's our humble privilege, basically, to represent the members, which would represent basically many of the breeders across multiple species from salmon, which we've heard about today, dairy and cattle, sheep and goats, pigs, and now moving into that uh, insect space. Um, and obviously, those breeders represent. Um, 
actual farmers, breeders that are out there in, in the industry. So, you know, it's really important that we understand that, yes, we're talking about an animal breeding, animal technology, but this radiates down through the whole, whole of rural Europe and our cultural heritage. Um, I think another point to uh, impact and talk about as well is that for, for centuries, honestly, we've been very progressive in terms of breeding in Europe and globally leading innovation in terms of selective breeding across multiple species. And, you know, this, this debate is honestly part of seeing whether where we fit into a more global breeding platform now as a lot of these supply chains become global, as Laurent said. And I think it's a testament to the work that FAB do and, and, and uh, programs like Code Efabar that show the European breeders and European producers are being proactive in trying to make sure that we have sustainable and responsible breeding into the future that we want to increase to engage and be transparent in that breeding process. So in the context of animal breeding, I think it's really to fo focus on three uh, core principles of uh, innovation. I think this technology and, and uh, honestly, this technology or other new technologies in the context of animal breeding really needs to be focused around animal well breed animal well-being um, that delivers benefit to farmers and sustainably improving animals' lives today. I think that's where we're at when I speak to members across all of the species. We need to be transparent in our efforts when it comes to animal breeding and the utilization of technologies. And we need to proactively today, especially in the age of social media, with the whole supply chain, all the way from the consumers to the uh, research institutes that uh, Laurent represents in terms of Faber TP. Now, in terms of what I think when we start looking down the supply chain and we look at the context of legislation or more importantly, consumers, average European citizens, which is where FAB and the breeding industry really want to engage. I think there, the value principles around the use of genome editing really involve transparency. I think that when we talk about these new technologies, there's nowhere to hide. We've got to be transparent and we've got to have open dialogue. And I really appreciate the comments of, of Frank in, in his presentation talking about engaging in that dialogue. And I think that's one of the reasons why many breeding organizations sign up for FAB is to be a part of this dialogue. Um, we need to listen to all stakeholders. I think uh, understanding that, uh, or having the feeling when I speak to other stakeholders in the supply chain that uh, the animal breeding industry is not receptive and does not listen. Um, certainly I, I do not see that in my practical day-to-day -day, uh, life and certainly from an FAB perspective, we're open to listening to all members of the supply chain. But bottom line, as animal breeders, um, whether it's a salmon, a sheep, or a dairy cow, or a pig in my case, doing the right thing for the animals is core to what we do and making sure that, uh, you know, obviously that animal well being and sustainable breeding is at the core of what we do. So honestly, I look forward to the conversation today. Um, and honest, and I think it's about just more than animal, breed, uh, animal breeding in the, in the context of genome editing, because as we heard uh, from um, many of the panelists today and the discussions today, you know, what, what does genome editing touch? I mean, it, it, it touches rural economies all over Europe, whether it's a small Norwegian town or Soria here in Spain. It's about public safety because let's face it, um, COVID-19, a lot of uh, influenza there's a lot of things that can uh, zoonotic diseases so it has consequences for a, a public safety a public health perspective an animal welfare perspective we've talked about that and then of course the environmental sustainability so um certainly appreciate the opportunity and i look forward to de the debate thank you anna thanks both uh, yeah, we are going to, to the discussion now because we are late. <laughs> Finally, we are late. Uh, so, uh, Chala, um, have you? We have a, a lot of questions that have already been answered uh, by speakers. Uh, more technical questions, I guess. So perhaps we can go to the questions that are more general to the whole panel. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Please. 
So uh, thank you all. Uh, and may I uh, ask the panel uh, members to open their cameras as well, since these will be a panel discussion. So our first question is about uh, how we will, uh, how, how the panel thinks about uh, the gene editing being used to drive animals to, uh, to have more production or to faster growth or higher yields. Um, any comments on this? I can comment on that, Jella. Um, I think already uh, Laurent already made re made reference to this that um, traits like that, like higher yield and faster growth, tend to be um, polygenic traits, which means they're controlled by very ma many genes. And they, as such, they wouldn't be a target for gene editing because it's not it's not feasible to edit multiple multiple genes. Sometimes up to a hundred genes could be controlled in some of these traits. So the focus for gene editing has been on typically single gene traits, our traits with very small number of genes. And these tend to be health and welfare traits. So dehorning and cattle, sterility, disease resistance, typically. Mm -hmm. And another point to that is that it is using traditional breeding methods. It is very, I wouldn't say easy, but certainly very doable to increase growth. Um, it's quite a, a simple trait to record and to improve. Um, but typically, certainly in my industry, in the salmon industry, our biggest challenge is the health and welfare of fish, of all the fish. We can always make fish grow faster, but we want more fish to grow well. And this is where this is why these traits are so particularly important and challenging. Yeah, thank you. It's it's very clear answer, Rashi. Um, any other panelists would like to comment on this? Yeah, I, I can comment. Um, one of the things that uh, I agree with everything that Ashi and going back to Laurent's comments that they made, um, and I think this goes into, should we say this, I, I've had the discussion in the past and really appreciated the input uh, around, you know, gene editing, should we say facilitating this um, industrial agriculture? Um, because obviously if you f focus on the production traits, then we can, you know, is genome editing just facilitating that model of agriculture that we've had today? And I think if we look at, you know, the poll results and many of the traits, individual traits that we're looking at from a gene editing perspective today, it's really around, should we say, disease resistance and animal welfare. And honestly, if we start looking at some of those and I'm, I'm just going to use some pig examples because I'm that's what I'm most uh, I'm most familiar with but we look at resistance to the PERS virus where there's not an active there's not an effective vaccine today or we look at for example research going on in terms of African swine fever resistance um, those are not, shall we say, diseases of industrial agriculture because they can affect uh, extensive production just as badly as they could impact extensive production. I mean, if I look at um, Central Europe today and African swine fever uh, on the border in Germany or in Poland, um, and then I look at the example that I see in Russia, for example, one of the most effective ways Russia's managed their ASF outbreaks has really been around around great biosecurity in intensive production. Now, obviously, if I wanted to put an extensive farm, an outdoor farm in Poland today, I'm less likely to do that because I'm at risk from African swine fever, which we do not have an effective control. I see gene editing as a gateway to actually being able to facilitate some of the extensive p producers to, uh, to, to farm actually with greater safety than they have today. Yes, thank you. That's also clear that not everything is uh, uh, coming out of the intensive production or intensive production should be the, the main uh, scapey goat for all the diseases that we have, we have been dealing for years. Um, maybe I can uh, go to the second question um, and ask to the panel members again that if you uh, if you all agree that uh, the uh, the diseases that are arising from intensive uh, production systems should be dealt with by improving those conditions rather than by gene editing uh, for the disease resistance. What are your thoughts about this? I think it's pretty clear, but. Um... Still, we would like to hear. 
Um, if only it were so simple, Chala. Um, I mean, we've had many of the diseases we suffer from in, in salmon aquaculture are in the wild species, not just in a salmon in the wild, but in many other uh, fin fish, and even in 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 crustaceans and mollusks mollusks in the sea. So we are unusual in that we are farming in the wild, I suppose. Um, so diseases have always been with us. And, um, and diseases have always been with humans as well, as we're only all too aware at the moment. So um, we don't believe, uh, we, we know that the conditions under which we're farming are very, very good conditions for fish. For example, in salmon farming, 1% of the space of the sea pen is actually fish and 99% is water. Um, but diseases will always be where there are um, where there are hosts. So what we are striving to do, either through the use of vaccines, for example, or through better breeding techniques, is to give our animals the best chance they have to live a healthy life. And I actually see gene editing very like, very similar to vaccine, uh, not gene editing, sorry, breeding in general, as very similar to vaccination in that way, is that what we're doing is providing the tool for the animal to be the healthiest it yeah. can be. Yes, perfect, thank you. And uh, Frank, uh, Frank yeah, Maibu? Yeah, I, I think the, 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 the trigger here is to, to be um, not naive in two ways. So, so naive in the sense that um, in, in, in the, the way you phrase the question now, it suggests as, as if you can think, okay, if you just improve um, housing conditions or, or management, um, you, you will improve, um, you will, you will uh, have a kind of solve all, all problems. Um, and, and of course, that, that will not help. Um, and in that sense, uh, breathing and, and uh, uh, genome editing could help. At the same time, the other part is also trying to be not naive in the sense that what, what we call a kind of techno fix. So, so you see something happening and you just put a technology in and say, okay, um, all other things we, we leave um, um, unchanged. And I think it's, it's important to bring that together. So if, if you have um, high tech breeding, um, it should come with with high tech care for the animal as well, or not high tech, but but high high level of care as well. Um, so I I think um, it, it's it's not an either or. Um, but if you take the responsibility of um, breeding on high level, um, then management should be on high level as well. Um, so so I think it's it's um, a story that um, should should link and should bridge to each other. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's uh, another point of view. Thank you. Um, Sigrid, do you have any comments? I was uh, going to say something similar actually to Frank, that uh, I don't think that one excludes the other. I think it's important to have a holistic view of how uh, animal farming is, is uh, uh, organized and that you could use both tools, both improve uh, conditions um, at the farm, but also to use technologies like genome editing to improve animal health. Uh, it's not, uh, they are not mutually exclusive. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question for the panel is, uh, could genome editing actually contribute to increased genetic diversity in those livestock species that have shown diminished variability for like uh, for more homogeneous population over the last few decades? Maybe Anna, since you are maybe maybe some mm -hmm. thought about that. I don't think that genome editing can directly have an impact on uh, diversity, but um, genome editing can provide some opportunities for local breeds. For example, in my in my previous uh, talk, uh, I just said that we can do a lot of things just using selection and genomic selection. Is but genomic selection can only be applied on large reference population. In local breeds, you don't have this uh, reference population. So you don't benefit from genomic selection. In that case, that means that the large breeds can have more genetic progress than the local breeds. And I guess that in, in some way, uh, if the difference 
in terms of uh, um, efficiency between large grids and local grids is too, uh, too wide, this can lead to uh, some changes and some farmers can decide to adopt large grids instead of local grids. So using genome editing can also provide much more genetic progress in these local grids and bring more opportunities to keep these local grids alive and not just in, in, in storage, in uh, liquid nitrogen storage, mm -hmm. as it's done sometimes. Yes, thank you. That uh, puts uh, forward uh, the situation. Um, I say something or should I say something? Or did you want... Yes, yes, please. No, I was thinking, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And I definitely, in, in, you know, in terms of using non-targeted mutagenesis, just learned of mutagenesis, I think this is a much better idea. And definitely this can be pursued in a controlled way. That's the difference. You could sort of make, based on science, those targets that would maybe, what you think is the problem with your read. And then you can also replicate this because you know exactly what you're doing. So it's more safe in a way, but it's maybe a little bit speculative. So I guess they should, uh, it would be nice to do science on it first. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Anna. Anna, you have a question? Yes, uh, um, I, I think we have gone to the most of the questions. I mean, if there is something else I have missed, um, Chala. But I have a question regarding, uh, this is more for Frank and Sigrid, regarding transparency, and uh, perhaps to the other Frank, uh, maybe. Uh, but this is very legal, uh, uh, yeah, uh, regarding legislation. Uh, yesterday, uh, the transparency regulation entered into force in the European Union. And uh, so there is something there that could seek to, uh, to, to, uh, to involve uh, 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 more citizens and other stakeholders in the, in the process of uh, agreement uh, for market. Uh, so what do you think about this? And uh, for Frank, uh, some works, uh, it's, is this foreseen on the study of, from the commission to, to, to refer to this uh, transparency regulation? Well, I will maybe start. And yes, indeed, the transparency regulation is, is in force since, uh, no, since the, from tomorrow onward, I think 27, okay, end of this month, it is applicable. It is indeed uh, for season uh, extreme, I would say, degree of, of, of transparency if we compare to other, other countries and other blocks in the world. I mean, it, it, where in the past you could as an applicant easily say 99% uh, of my file is confidential business information, and therefore it cannot be shared with the, with the general public. This is now completely reversed. Now there is only very limited chapters that can be invoked as uh, confidential if motivated by. Okay, so in general, everything is public. In addition, an applicant that wants to apply for a GM plant or an NGT plant or whatever it is, needs to, in advance, say which studies he's going to perform to decide uh, to, to try to find out whether this product is safe uh, to be placed on the market. And this can be, this, this envisioned studies will be uh, open for comment, for public comment. So that is then, will then also be judged. And there will be an input from our side and from ESSA that would say, well, you would probably at least need to do this and this and this on top of this. Otherwise, it would be problematic. Then uh, the applicant can do all, all the studies if needed. And if in the end of the process, then there are studies which have uh, been announced as going to be done, and they are not done or the result is not there, you need, the applicant needs to explain why this is, was, is not there because uh, there have been rumors uh, in the past that, well, uh, this is what everybody says. An applicant in the end, he only submits the studies that suit him well, okay? So this is something that has been claimed for many, many years. Um, we have no evidence of this, but okay, this will make things uh, maybe a little bit more clear and, and uh, change this, uh, hopefully change these, these rumors. Whether the transparency regulation applies on the new on the new situation or the situation as it might be in the future, yes, of course, the transparency regulation applies on everything which is regulated products, which is, means if you need an approval, an authorization, you need to go through the process. It fully applies. There is no escape. So, I hope this helps. Thank you. 
Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Sarah. No. No, you were asking your question on it. Yeah, but you are the moderator. Sigrid, <laughs> have you uh, an opinion on, uh, on this transparency regulation? Uh, no, I don't think I will comment on the regulation specifically, but I would rather make a more general comment on the need for transparency because I really think that it's key uh, because as we've learned from the earlier GMO debates, the narratives that have been told that uh, a key part of the problem is the, the, the lack of transparency and the lack of trust. And I think regardless of, of the benefits of the technology itself, um, we will never succeed if we don't have consumers and the public on board. So, uh, and I think also we've learned that now from, uh, from the COVID situation with the vaccines, that uh, transparency is key uh, and information is key. So that's um, really my, I think, I, I think that's a nice uh, place for me to end this, to really encourage the, all the academic and the industry um, that considers to use this technology to really be transparent and open and participate in the, the public debate. Okay, thank you very much, Sigrid. Uh, um, there is an interesting question. Uh, who do you think should decide in which circumstance should gene editing be permitted? Frank, Frank. Guys, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Me. Uh, well, that is indeed, uh, I think, a societal debate. And the societal debate for us, I mean, we try to distill from the uh, consultation we have done and on the, on the 45 or I don't know how many replies we got in, we try to distill what, what is the feeling of the society. And this is what will be, uh, of course, a part in our report. And then in the future, of course, it will, it will depend whatever happens. Uh, it is not the commission or me or we in the unit that are going to decide. I mean, we will make maximum a proposal and then it is open in the discussion. This is, a, this is a topic, this is a subject, this is an area where the commission cannot decide on its own. This is a co-decision procedure. This is done together with the parliament and the, and the council of the European Union. So in the council is the governments of the 27 member states in the, in the European Parliament, it is the EPs, the members of European Parliament that have been elected by the European citizens. So these, these two groups have their input. We have the duty in such areas to do the drafting, to do all the work and then bring it to them, discuss with the Parliament, discuss with the Council, hear their comments, try to get everything together so that in the end uh, we can have a good decision that goes where it goes. And in this process, well, the council can decide that the commission misinterpreted the results or has a wrong feeling and things like that. But this is where it happens. Who decides what you can do where, in which situation. Yes, thank you. So um, thank you, Frank. So I think this um, um, also, uh, Frank, do you have anything to add on this point? Mm -hmm. But I think your response will be similar? I think Sigrid has, has I, I can say, but, but Sigrid already indicated she wanted to say something. So, so. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I didn't yeah. see that. I'll keep it very short. Uh, I just want to underline the fact that we need to rephrase the question, not just ask whether or not genome editing should be allowed, but what should we use it for? That's a more important question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Anna? Thank you. Is raising hand. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think uh, Frank and Sigrid, Sigrid hit it on the head there. And but I actually think that the that, that this question also relates to the last point as well. I think that the transparency piece is a key part of that question on which traits we should use. And what we need, um, going back to the talk we heard before, is that robust framework that facilitates a transparent usage of this technology within the context of member states. So that, and then that way we can filter that into, hey, maybe on a, you know, case by case basis or part of that regulatory framework, we can utilize or not utilize that, that particular uh, trait or, or technology. But uh, the transparency piece, I think, comes first, and we can link that into the legislative piece. 
Yes, thank you, Craig, for the addition. Uh, now we have a question for EFA, Fabri TP, and uh, the European Commission. Uh, what uh, would you, how do you think about the Norwegian proposed long genome editing? So, um, may I give you the floor, uh, Anna, first? Yeah, I, I can take it. Um, well, that's a, a very uh, interesting proposal. I mean, the, we uh, we know secret uh, since uh, three years, so uh, we have discussed a lot of about this. I think that the point is what not th what we think about the proposal is what we can take from different countries. Uh, there are a lot of ideas. There are other regulations in other countries around the world on genome editing on. Uh, genetic modification. So it's one more proposal, I mean, because it's not enforced. And uh, every, that's the, the, the exercise that we should do is to take what is running and is working in other places or what are the ideas and to have uh, perhaps a global governance on this topic. Because as uh, there are uh, one comment too on the, on, on the chat or on the, on the question and answer box saying that uh, one of the main problems is that we cannot detect this products, these animals. So, uh, I mean, if we don't want to be detected, that's not possible. So the, the, the Norwegian proposal is interesting. It's another one, but there's not the only one to take uh, in board. But I will be happy to hear Frank too about it. Yes, well, indeed, uh, during the last year, uh, one of the tasks we did with a few people was uh, we studied uh, the legislation and the legislative uh, changes going on in approximately 30, 35 countries in the world to, to see how the, this, the countries that have already taken a position in this debate, how they think, how they regulate, what they do, and how these systems interact with each other, how products can be imported, exported from the one to the other, and how this would articulate with our current situation. And of course, what could be the impact of future changes? Where, because we do not have to forget the EU is one of the big exporting markets uh, in the world. Uh, if we, all legislation we make might affect our import export position and therefore, the wealth and welfare of the society in the European Union. So we constantly monitoring at the monitor at this time all these uh, changes that are ongoing, including uh, the interesting proposals and ideas that are going on in Norway. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, maybe just one last question. Do we have time for that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> To what extent, <clears throat> sorry, can genome editing in livestock help us achieve the goals set out in the farm to fork strategy under the EU Green Deal? I think this is an important question to answer just at the verge of everything. I might have to start as the Green Deal is uh, ours, I would say, no? <laughs> yes. Well, in general, we, we all think that uh, gene editing is, is a tool, it's maybe not the miracle tool, but it's a tool. And in, uh, we are very much in favor of an inclusive society where people and, uh, and products and techniques get the chance, the fair chance to demonstrate how they can contribute to what we have now set as important goals for the future to have a sustainable agriculture with which we can feed the world and certainly feed the EU. And there we think at this moment that they certainly have should get the opportunity that is clear. I don't see how we could rule out any, any way of production uh, in advance, like saying you are not in the game. That is uh, very difficult, I think, at the moment where the Commission has set its uh, very ambitious goals on sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Frank. Um, Craig, Lauren, anybody else? Um, I'll, I'll just add something. I mean, I, I really appreciate your comments, Frank. And uh, I think we, you know, I've been following the farm to fork strategy and the, and the Green Deal for 
a period of time now. And uh, I think there was a wonderful presentation by Meet the Facts yesterday in terms of their, 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 their the, some of the challenges are out there. And I, I agree with Frank completely that, I mean, they are lofty targets. And I think everybody, no matter wh whether we're talking from an animal breeding perspective, a whole supply chain perspective, needs to work together to achieve those goals. But I mean, I think that given, given new tools, new technologies like gene editing, those those goals are achievable, but uh, certainly we need to innovate in many ways, in many different areas of agriculture to hit the goals of the Green Deal. But um, so, like I say, I, I agree with you, Frank, this is just, just one tool to get us down the road. Yeah, maybe in addition to that, I, 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 I think the Green Deal helps in, in the discussion also to, to broaden up, so, so not only to have the um, a, a kind of one shot discussion saying um, are we in favor or again gene editing um, but to, to have the broader discussion and say okay well, what do we want with within Europe um, with um, agriculture with livestock um, and from there on to have a discussion um, whether and to what extent gene editing fits in it um, and I think that's that's a much more it's a complex but much more fruitful discussion um, than um, the, the current debate to say is it GMO or is it not um, um, is it yeah? um, because then then we end in a very technical um, uh, in spite of its importance technical debate um, and loses um, a, a lot of lot of its potential yes exactly yes Anna please go I think it's very important not to stop the science I have sometimes experience that people say to me why are you working on this this is too much regulations and that's very uninspiring and very not looking into the future. We need to do the science irrespective of the regulations. And maybe one of these scientific findings will be what people, you know, what will, you know, bring us into the next step and maybe provide a green deal, a green solution. But if, if you and everybody else is sitting, oh, let's not do this because there is regulation. Let's not do the science. That is a very, um, not a very good path to walk, I think. That's a very important message uh, that has to go out. I mean, we have to do the science to be able to provide the solutions and it cannot be stopped, that science, because of the current <laughs> regulations. Very important. Yes. Yes, thank you, Anna. I think also Corona has taught uh, all the societies a lot about how to relate with science and uh, policies. Um, Anna, we're back to you because I think we're over time, so I couldn't take more questions. I'm but trying to respond to some of the questions. Okay. <laughs> Writing, uh, because there are a lot of them that uh, everyone is asking a lot of different uh, uh, relevant questions. So. Uh, I think we don't have time anymore. We are running out of time. Uh, so we have the last question of Slido. Uh, Isabella, can you help me? Yes. To bring this light with the code. I mean, some of you have already response and uh, those of that do not agree uh, with genome editing can now give uh, their opinion. So do you think that genome editing could be another tool in the toolbox of animal breeders after having this uh, presentations and discussion today, which is not finished. Um, we need more debate, we need not more conversation, we need to explain better what is even selective breeding, genomics, genome editing, and all. Um, so yeah, vote please, and uh, I'm going to give the floor just after to Ashi to make Three minutes conclusions. <laughs> uh, so yes. Uh, okay, it's it's being increasing on the votes actually. So we are going just to wait uh, some seconds. Well, I have to say that uh, there is a lot of people coming from the breeding sector today. So we have three percent strongly disagree. No comment. Four percent. Disagree 9%, like you can see, and uh, yeah, majority is, well, <laughs> is still increasing, I'm thinking, and they, are, they agree or strongly agree. 
I mean, we will share in the summary of uh, today, we'll, we can share the, the, the votes uh, and make the, the uh, and explain independent of the, and the number of people coming from the, from the breathing sector and other sector stakeholders, NGOs and so on, because these figures just now, just strongly agree and, uh, 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 and agree. Yeah, um, and 80%, it's, uh, yeah, it's not relevant. I mean, so we have to give the floor to other people that are less represented today at the, at the debate. So Ashi, are you ready? <laughs> yes, I was hoping that would get to 50% for strongly agree. But we should wait until we get to 50%, I know. Anyway, I just want to close up this meeting today. I want to th thank everybody for attending, over 300 people, over 350 people. It shows the level of interest there is in this subject. So thank you all. Thank you to Anna and her team at EFAB for organizing not just this um, seminar, but these Breeders Talk Green seminars, they're super. And thank you especially to all our speakers today. Um, I think we saw a good cross section from what this issue is about, scientific, regulatory, legislative and ethical. Um, so I think today was a good cross section of that. We could have spent a day on these issues easily. Um, but I really, I particularly, of course, I know I'm biased, but I, I, and I'm a scientist. So I particularly liked Anna's presentation on salmon because that's something that's close to my own heart. But what she showed is that we have a tool here that, that, that can be used for multiple wins. It can, you know, we have a tool that can be used for a win for, for the environment, um, a win for the industry, and indeed a win for fish health. And we don't often get those kind of tools. Um, and I think it was Sigrid also mentioned that we, we do have something that can induce sterility in salmon already. We do have um, triploidy, but that's like a sledgehammer. You know, it's the equivalent of a, maybe a chainsaw versus a scalpel here when you, when you look at what, what it actually does. So triploidy adds another set of chromosomes. It's kind of an assault on the genome and sterility is a side effect of that. But triploidy is allowed and triploidy is used, commonly used, because it, it, it solves a problem, but it also gives welfare problems to, to our health and welfare problems to animals. So we have a better tool in our toolbox. So I, I share Anna's frustration, I could pick it up there at the end, and that we have this these tools and um, we are, particularly slow in even developing a framework around this around how we can legislate for this. Um, and of course, this is not, this gene editing is not confined to Europe. This breeding is a global activity. So in, in my company, we are breeding fish mostly outside the European Union. Um, so Norway, well, you can argue inside or outside, but um, North America, South America, UK, now outside the European Union, and our smallest breeding activities are in, in Europe, actually. So if these tools are, are approved and regulated in those regions, we will be using them in those regions because they are to the betterment of, as I said, the environment, the industry, and the fish. So we do need to bring the public along with us, as Sigrid said, but we need the legislators to help us with that. And we need the framework for that. It's not going to happen on its own. And coronavirus showed us that we have always, we've always thought in Europe that we're at the forefront of lots of things scientific, but we haven't been on this. So, you know, maybe we need to be a little bit more flexible and a little bit more, lis lis listen to the scientists. So with that, I'll call this to a close. I wish you all a good weekend and hand you back over to Anna. Yeah, nothing to add. I mean, we are out of time, so um, people is living. So uh, yes, thank you very much all for coming today, joining us as, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again and uh, keep safe and healthy 
in this time, hopefully we can meet very soon all together and uh, in a room to discuss about this topic and breathing in general. Thank you very much all. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. I can give uh, the, the, the question and answers open a bit to respond to some of them that some of the people have asked questions. I can try to respond to some of them. But the, you can, the speakers can go, you can leave if you want, but I, I can leave, we can leave the decision a bit open to, 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 uh, to answer to this.